Um, wow, that was a little overwhelming. And, and the funny thing is about, uh, you know, when Eric said he wanted me to come and speak to people and teach people about JavaScript was the day that I started here, he actually already had me scheduled to teach some classes. <laughs> so there was no pressure at all. Um, so I was thinking this morning uh, while I was doing my hair how I should open up this presentation. I sort of figured out what I wanted, the points I wanted to get across, but I didn't know how to start out. I um, thought that I would start out then by saying, you know, not a lot of people talk about the maintainability of code anymore. Uh, a lot of focus is on efficiency and optimization, and there is a place for that. Uh, it's definitely good to have your code running a few milliseconds faster when you're running a website that's trafficked by half a billion people. Um, but it's also really important to think about the other people that you work with and who can understand your code and what happens to your code after you leave. So the question really is why? Why do we care about making our code maintainable? Well, some have estimated that as much as 80% of the time that you spend touching code, you're maintaining it. You're not actually writing new code. I mean, how many times do you actually sit down in front of a blank text editor and say, aha, here's my palette upon which I'm going to create? Just doesn't happen all that often. I mean, chances are the first few weeks that you sat in your desk, you were looking at somebody else's code trying to figure out what was going on. And it's really, really, really important. And I know you're not supposed to repeat words over and over again when you're speaking, but really, it's important. Uh, the best example I can give was at a former job when I was set to implement a feature. And the time estimate that was given to me, this is the amount of time it will take you to do this, uh, was two days. And it did actually take two days to implement, but that was only after I spent three days trying to figure out what was already going on. Really, really important. And who cares? Well, for one, your employer cares. I mean, like it or not, you weren't hired just because you look pretty sitting in front of a computer. You were hired to create value for your company. And you do that by creating intellectual property that survives well beyond your tenure there. Your coworkers. I mean, how many people get to work in a vacuum where they're the only people that touch their code? And you know that tomorrow, OK, besides you. And you know that tomorrow, nobody else is going to have changed your code. In reality, it doesn't happen all that often. So your coworkers really depend on your code to make sense. Because when they get a bug, when you're on vacation, they want to be able to fix it most of the time. And don't forget about the coworkers that you don't have yet. People transition in and off of teams all the time. Those new people that come in, they need to ramp up as quickly as possible. And the best way for that to happen is to make sure that your code is maintainable. They can get in, take a look, and understand what's going on. Now, the third group who cares is the development community. And this is really important if you're working on open source projects or uh, public APIs. You may not know who's going to be looking at your code next. Maybe someone halfway around the world. Maybe someone just up the street who's going to hunt you down because they can't understand what you wrote. You just don't know. So keep in mind when you're writing code that you're writing it not just for yourself. You're writing it for a whole lot of other people who are depending on you. And look at your code as an opportunity to teach someone else the right way to do things. When you have well-written code, other people are going to look at it. They're going to copy it, hopefully not paste it directly. But they can learn from that. They can understand, you know what? If I was able to go in and within 10, 15 minutes understand what this person was trying to do, that must be pretty good code. So what is maintainability? Well, first of all, it's understandable. If I look at your code and say, oh, yeah, I kind of get that. I sort of see what he's going for with that. Kind of makes sense. So it's intuitive. Things just seem to be in the right place. You find yourself saying, well, gee, yeah, if I was going to do that, that's probably the way I would do it. That makes sense. So it's adaptable. 
means that something has to change a little bit in the future, not a big problem to change it. You can go in, figure out where to go, and make those changes. It's extendable. We know that features are coming and going constantly, and you really can't plan on something that you write just staying the way that it is. So you need to write it in such a way that if features change in the future, you're not painting yourself into a corner. You're not painting your coworkers into a corner by design decisions that you've made. And the last one, uh, which may arguably be the most important, is it's debuggable. So if something goes wrong, you know where to go. You know where to look, you know where to start, you know where to finish. So what sort of things can you do to make your JavaScript more maintainable? Now the things I'm gonna be talking about, I wanna say right up front, are suggestions. There are things that I've seen, the things that I've witnessed, there are things that I've used. Uh, they may not be appropriate for your individual teams. It's completely up to you to go back and say, you know what, I like that part, I think I'm gonna try and do that, or you know what, that part really doesn't fit what we're trying to do in our team, so leave it. You know, I, I'm not up here preaching to you that this is the absolute best way to do it. I'm just saying that these are some things you may want to consider when writing your code. So code conventions, lots of fun. Uh, a lot of times you don't think about the format in which you're writing your code. But it's really important within your individual teams to decide upon how you're going to write your code. You make sure that everybody is on the same page so that things are being done the same way. And uh, a lot of companies have pages and pages and pages written up of code conventions of how you should do things. I'm not gonna bore you by going through every single thing that I've seen people do. I'm just gonna touch on some of the high level stuff that I think you get the biggest impact for. So it's really important for your code to be readable. And readability isn't just understandability, but it's actually being able to see the flow of the code, to understand where it's going. You see where there are loops, you see where there are if statements, you see where there are functions you can kind of understand what's going on in there. And a really simple thing you can do to help increase the readability is indent your code. And more than that, make sure that the other people on your team are indenting the code the same way, which is even more important, I think, than just the indentation itself. Because when you're passing files around and you see things darting in and out, it's really hard to figure out what's going on. You know, how many people have actually spent time looking at somebody else's code, but first re-indenting it so you could figure out what was going on? Okay, I know nobody wants to admit to it, but we've all done it at some point. Just come up with something. Say, you know what, guys? Let's use four spaces. Everybody agree, four spaces? Yes, okay, good. Done, and then do it. You can, I mean, every editor that we use now, unless people are still using Notepad, in which case you really should upgrade, um, will allow you to set what you want the tab key to do. So set it for some spaces, discuss among your peers, figure out something that works for you, and then do it. Uh, and then the second part is comment your code. Now, nobody likes commenting your code. I, I've never been someplace where somebody said, you know what, I wish that tomorrow morning when I went into work, I had some code to comment. <laughs> I mean, that would just make my day. And nobody likes to do it, but there's a reason why in college they encourage you to do it. And I actually had a professor who would take points off if there were spelling errors in your comments. So he was trying to hammer home that comments were really important. And while it affected my GPA a little bit, I started to understand that they really do have some value. Now I'm not saying you have to comment every line, that'd be a little ridiculous. Um, but there's some things that you definitely should comment. Take a look at each method that you're doing tell me what that method's purpose is. So if you have something called get name, uh, don't have the comment be uh, get to the name. Well, yeah, I kind of guessed that from the name of the function. But really, what's the purpose? Does it get the name of a product that's used elsewhere? Does it get the name of a user? Is it getting the name of a setting? Tell me, what is it doing? Where is it being used? How is it intended to be used? What's the data that you're expecting to be passed into it? Does it return a value? If so, of what significance is that value to me? 
tell me why I want to use your method. Even if you don't put any comments inside, just at least do this. Just let me know what it is that your method is designed to do. Now another thing that you should do is large sections of code. If you have a whole section devoted to uh, assigning event handlers, you have like 10, 20 lines that are just doing that, just put a little comment in ahead that says, you know, next bunch of lines, assigns event handlers to the UI. It's very simple, uh, doesn't take much time to do. So another area is difficult to understand algorithms. If you're doing something that nobody's done before, or that you think that nobody's done before, or if you're patting yourself on the back because you spent five days trying to figure this thing out and you finally did, chances are that somebody looking at your code won't be able to figure it out right away. So take a little time before that, throw in a comment that says how you're doing what you're doing and why you're doing it. Not everybody is gonna instantly be able to look at that and say, oh, that's a bucket sort algorithm, clearly that's what he's doing. It's just not that easy. And although you try to make your code maintainable and readable, sometimes you need some extra hints so that people can understand exactly what it is that you're trying to do. So the last thing that you should definitely, definitely comment are hacks. Now these are hacks that are either due to browser bugs or something else that just can't be done in a regular logical way. Um, if for some reason you decide to set a timeout at one point where it looks like a function should just be called on its own, tell me why. There may be a perfectly valid reason for that. Uh, but you wanna make sure that when other people go in and take a look at your code, they don't look at that line and say, oh, you know what, I know a better way of doing that. I'm just gonna fix that while I'm in here. And next thing you know, you reintroduce the bug that your hack was supposed to fix. So anytime you're doing something, say because it's not working right in IE, it's not working right in Firefox, put that in there. Say, you know what, I'm doing this because in IE, when I didn't, the whole browser crashed. I'm doing this because in Firefox, if I wasn't doing this, it caused an infinite loop. Just tell me why so I know not to try to fix something that you've already fixed. So naming. Uh, variables and functions should be named logically. I know it, it seems kind of silly, but you should name them in ways that make sense. And don't worry about the length of the variables and the function names. I really don't care. If you need to make it verbose to get the point across about what it's doing, do it. All of our JavaScript is gzipped over the internet anyways. So most of those characters that you're putting in become negligible on the grand scheme. Make sure that you have variable names that are nouns and function names that begin with uh, verbs. Everybody remembers that from English? No? Both of my parents are English teachers. This got hammered into me really early. But it's really important that people know what type of data they're dealing with, especially in JavaScript where functions can actually be passed around as variables. It's really helpful to understand what you're dealing with. Um, and the example that I have here is that you know, for functions that return Boolean values, a lot of people put is as the first word to make sure that you know, it's more logical. Is the thing found? Is it valid? Yes, no. And this last one is something that I really want to hammer home. Avoid useless variable names. I know we all love foo and bar and temp, uh, but that stuff doesn't belong in production code go back and make sure we know what that variable is being used for. Because as much as we love it, foo doesn't tell us much. So this is another big one in JavaScript, is indicating the type of the variable that you're using. Since JavaScript is loosely typed, you want to make sure that you're telling people what type of data you're expecting to be in that variable. Now there are three different ways that I've seen this done. Uh, the first is by a combination of the name and initializing it to a value right off the bat. So if you have a variable named found and you're initializing it to false, it becomes pretty clear that you're expecting that to be a Boolean. And later on, inside an if statement, you say if found. Again, it's pretty clear that that's what you wanted. Um, the second one is Hungarian notation, which seems to be a love it or hate it thing. Uh, there are a lot of people who love writing code this way. There are a lot of people who hate writing code this way. Uh, 
I'll leave it up to you to make up your mind. Uh, but the basic idea is that you prepend a letter or two to the variable to explain what type of data you are expecting to have in that variable. So in this case, the little s that precedes name is for string. So holding a string, you can put i for int, f for float, whatever you think makes the most sense. So the third is type comments, which is just to insert a little comment after a declaration of a variable that says, this is the type of data that I want to be using here. Um, and it, you know, it doesn't have to be something that's officially supported in JavaScript. It could be a logical data type that you're using. Um, say float int string, whatever it is that you happen to want, just throw it in there. If you have a custom object you're using, put it in there too. Um, it just really helps as you're going through the code to understand what these variables are that you're dealing with. Okay, so the second part of maintainable JavaScript is loose coupling. Now when I'm talking about loose coupling, what I'm actually talking about is when you need to make a change to code, you should be able to go and do that in one place. You shouldn't have to hunt and peck and try to figure out where the various parts are that are causing you problems. So we have these three layers on the client side that usually interact pretty well. Um, we have the HTML for the structure, we have the CSS for the presentation, and we have the JavaScript for the behavior. Now there are a reason why these are three separate layers, that they should be kept that way. So if something is wrong with your markup, you want to be able to say, okay, I know I should be going to the part that's creating the markup to find out what the problem is. Likewise, if there's something wrong with the presentation, you should be able to say to yourself, okay, I'm going to go take a look at the CSS. That's clearly where this problem is. And keeping all of these layers loosely coupled is sometimes tough because you can do so much with JavaScript that you sometimes forget that just because you can doesn't mean that you should. So separate your HTML and your JavaScript. Uh, this means two things. First, don't bury your JavaScript inside of your HTML. Event handlers shouldn't be assigned by saying A on click equals and then your function. Why? Two reasons. One is that there's a possibility the user may click on that before the JavaScript for the function is loaded, in which case you're going to get an error. Two, that if I want to go and change what that link does now, I actually need to go into two places. One, I need to go and change the HTML, and two, I need to go and change wherever the JavaScript is. It's really inefficient. You should just be attaching your event handlers uh, using JavaScript directly. There's no need to put it inside of your HTML. And the other thing to watch out for is putting HTML in your JavaScript. Now, I know there's a real tendency to love to do this because it's an easy way to update your page quickly. There's a lot of dynamic stuff you can do. Uh, but if you have an entire chunk of your JavaScript file containing HTML code, you're doing something wrong. You shouldn't have that much HTML inside of your JavaScript because it now complicates maintenance and debugging. If there is a markup problem, now you have to figure out, one, well, is it being produced by the same thing that's producing all the other markup? No. Okay, now where do I go? All right, so I have to start searching through JavaScript files. And if you've ever tried modifying HTML code that's being output by JavaScript, it's really, really difficult. And you end up introducing a lot more bugs that way. So whenever possible, try to keep your HTML out of your JavaScript. Uh, there's always going to be exceptions to this rule. As I said earlier, you may be doing specific things for which this doesn't apply. But generally speaking, try to keep all that HTML out of your JavaScript. It's really going to make everybody's job a lot easier. So next, separate your CSS and your JavaScript. Now, fortunately, you can only embed JavaScript and CSS in IE. And also, fortunately, we have a lot of people at Yahoo that tell you, don't do this. I'm just going to add my name to that list of people. Don't do this. I can tell you about a time when I spent two days literally trying to track down a JavaScript bug that was caused directly by an expression in CSS. And why did it take me two days to track it down? Because it never occurred to me that if there was a JavaScript error, I should look in the CSS file. It just wasn't logical to me that that's where the error could be. But in the end, that's where it was. Um, just don't do it. 
And on the other side, keep your CSS out of your JavaScript. Anytime you're touching a style object in JavaScript, you need to stop and think about what you're doing. If you're defining the format of something inside of your JavaScript, then you're mixing up your layers. CSS is where you should be defining stuff like fonts and colors and bold and height and width. All that stuff is what CSS is good for. Now, I recognize that you're going to have to change stuff from time to time in JavaScript. You're going to want to change the appearance of things. And that's cool. But you should do that by defining a class and then in JavaScript, change the class of the element. So that way, you still have everything contained inside of your CSS. You're just changing a class name inside of JavaScript. And that way, if something isn't appearing correctly, you can just go to the CSS and try to figure out where it is in there. So loose coupling also has to deal with events. Now, if you read the title of this, event handlers should handle events, it seems a little bit silly. But that's really what event handlers should do. That's what they're good for. That's what they were designed for. So if you take a look at this function, we have an event handler you can assume was assigned to a text box. So when you hit enter, which would be key code 13, it's going to do a bunch of stuff. It's going to do a little calculation. It's going to update the UI a little bit. It's going to display a message to the user. Okay, all useful things. But now, what if you want that same behavior to occur for some other user action? Maybe a mouse click somewhere. OK, so now what you need to do is create another event handler and duplicate this code. Except good programmers know that you shouldn't actually duplicate code. You want to write another function that contains that code. But why not just do that to begin with? So the application logic should not be contained inside of your event handlers. Your event handler should only call things that perform application logic. Because at some point in the future, I mean, it's almost guaranteed these days that an interaction is never sacred. Chances are it's going to change. It's going to be modified. There's going to be stuff that you say one day, oh, I want to be able to click to do this. Another day, I want to be able to type to do this. It's going to happen, I promise you. And the best way to make sure that you're ready for that is to keep your application logic out of the event handlers. Now, this means more than just putting stuff into external functions. It also means making sure that nothing but an event handler is dealing with an event object. So in this case, we have um, event.keycode that's being interrogated to see what's going on. But really, the functions don't care why they're being called. They only care that they are. So all those functions should not be dependent on an event object. If there's some information that you need to gather from somewhere, do that and then pass it in. But make sure that the functions can exist completely outside of an event scope. And why this helps you is that if you can write a bunch of code, you pop open the Firebug console, and you can type in directly the function with the application logic to check to see what it's doing. You don't need to worry about, OK, I need to go over here and click on this, and then I need to set a debug thing and make sure that it's all working. No, just type it right in. And later on, when somebody comes along and says, you know what, I need to move that functionality somewhere else, you're going to be prepared. So the next section is all about programming practices. So We've talked up to this point about some ways to format your code and about keeping code separated in logical ways. The programming practices are much more about how you go about designing your code uh, and the things that you should do to make sure that your code is making sense. So this is something that people around campus hear me saying a lot. Don't modify objects that you don't own. This can get you into a lot of trouble. I mean, JavaScript is really, really adaptable. So you go in and you say, oh, look, there's an object. I wish there was another method on it. Boom, you add it. You're good. Uh, the problem is when you're modifying objects that you don't own, you're polluting the environment for other people who are also programming in it. So if you decide that you want to add a method to something and you're dependent upon that to do some sort of logic, you're now saying to other people, hey, you're forced to have this. You need it too. And this can really be a problem if you end up in a situation where later the actual person who owns that object 
adds a method of the same name. It may possibly do slightly different things. And now you have to go back, change your code so that it's not clashing with the original code, and then make sure that the places that you were using your new method aren't using the new method that was just added. It ends up being a huge, huge mess. So don't add methods to objects that you don't own. Don't override methods on objects that you don't own. Now, overriding the methods is even worse because other people are dependent upon knowing how that particular method is working. They see it in documentation. They have used it before in other situations, and now all of a sudden they go to use it in your application, and it's different. And it takes a lot of debugging time to figure out that somebody just decided, ah, I know how that method should work better, so I'm just going to override it. So don't do it. And I just want to make a point that the native objects, you don't own those. Object, array, string, all that stuff, you should really be leaving them alone because you can completely disrupt uh, code development that's going on in your group by altering how those very basic objects work. So avoid globals. Uh, this is something that's really caught on at, at Yahoo lately. I'm really happy about it. Uh, all publicly accessible functions and variables should be attached to an object of some sort. It shouldn't just be left in the global scope. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that. People will talk to you about uh, performance and other things. Again, my main concern is just about maintainability. You get a lot more information about what's going on when you're using methods that are attached to objects. You can understand the context. You understand where to look if you have a problem with that specific method. Have you ever tried to figure out where a function was defined that wasn't attached to an object in a site that has dozens of JavaScript files? It's absolutely maddening. So make sure that you always have those attached. Namespace your objects, which is also really big at Yahoo. Uh, make sure that they make sense. We're sort of blessed to have the global Yahoo object to work with that we can attach things to. And so now we don't have a bunch of global objects. We just have the one Yahoo object that we all are attaching things to, which is great. We have everything nice and refined. Uh, but don't go overboard with your namespacing. I mean, you don't need a really, really long namespace to make sure that your stuff is maintainable and logical. So keep it to three levels. Um, and just don't go overboard with it. Uh, don't overuse popular techniques. And it, it seems a, a little bit counterintuitive because popular techniques are, are used a lot. But any time you're sitting down and you're saying, uh, okay, I'm going to throw in a closure, I'm going to throw in an object literal, stop and think for a minute. Is that really what you mean to do? I mean, about five years ago, nobody's using closures in JavaScript. There are very few nested functions. And all of a sudden, it's like the flavor of the year. Everybody loves closures. There's tons of cool stuff you can do with it. I can make private variables. I can make private functions. It's incredible. Um, but they're oftentimes really hard to follow. Uh, I've come across a lot of code where I'm looking at it. And now, I may not be the brightest guy, but if I sit down and looking at JavaScript code and I get confused, then I get a little worried. Like, maybe something is just not right. I'm missing something clearly that's very important. Um, so my advice really is to use your closures and your nested functions sparingly. I can almost guarantee you that anything you're going to be doing on a normal day-to-day -day basis that you're doing with closures can be done without them. Uh, it sometimes takes a little bit of extra thought to do, but it is possible. And a lot of the places where we traditionally have used closures, now we have tools to help us work around. Like one of the places was event handlers. Uh, used to be a really big offender of creating closures. But we really don't need to do that anymore thanks to the YUI library and the event utility, which allows you to pass in the scope of an event handler, uh, what scope you want it to run in. So you don't need to use closures for that anymore. And there are dozens of other examples that I won't bore you with. Uh, that you could go through and say, you know what? I think I could do this sequentially instead. Because as cool as it is, a function that calls a function that defines a function that returns a function that calls a method on an object, um, it's not necessary, and it can be really confusing to your coworkers. Uh, and the other one is object literals. And there's really only two times when you should be using object literals. Uh, one is that when you're creating singletons, so 
you know that that's the only instance of that thing ever. You don't have to worry about losing track of it. You are always going to be accessing it in the exact same way. It's not going to be passed around. Um, and to pass data. Um, you see a lot of things now that use object literals to pass data into functions because you can specify any number of options. A lot of the YUI methods do that. Um, and that is the best way to get data from here to there. But if you're creating a bunch of objects that all have the same methods, you really need to be defining your own type of class uh, to be creating multiple instances of that. There's no reason to be creating object literals because you'll lose any semantic, semantic value that's attached to them. Uh, throw your own errors. So here I am talking about maintainability, and I'm saying, hey, cause some errors. Uh, but what I'm actually saying is that errors are going to occur. And we know that browsers give really crappy error messages. I mean, how many people have ever seen the error message, uh, undefined is undefined? Oh, that's really useful, thanks. Now I gotta spend the rest of my day figuring out where that magical undefined is. Uh, if you have a function that you know there is some case where it may fail catastrophically, go in there, write an if statement, and throw your own error. And put in that error, hey, this is why this thing is failing. If you have a function that is expecting at least one argument and that argument isn't passed in, throw an error and say, hey, you know what? I was expecting an argument and it wasn't passed in. That's why this is blowing up. It really, really cuts down on your debugging time when an error pops up that says, function name, here's what went wrong. Oh, cool. So now I know I'll go to that, I'll make some changes, and boom, there you go. Uh, the next thing, avoid null comparisons. We all love comparing things to null. We want to check if something is passed into a function, compare it against null. If it's not null, it must be there. Well, that's not always true. Because when you're comparing something against null, all you're learning is what it is not. You're not learning about what it is. So if you have a function that expects an array to be passed in, somewhere along that function, it's going to be calling sort. Simply testing to see if that value is not null isn't good enough. Because a string could be passed in. Well, that string isn't null, so it's going to go through. And we're going to try to call sort on it. And it's going to explode because there's no sort method on a string. So what you really want to do is figure out what type of data you want to be dealing with. In this case, I want to know if it's an array. So I throw in instance of array, which returns true only if that object is an array. Any other time, it's false. And then I know that the type of data that I thought I was dealing with is not really there. And if you want to go one step further and say, you know what, I expected this to be an array, if it's not an array, I'm really upset. You throw an error and say, hey, I expected this to be an array. Something went wrong, you should look into it. So the two ways to avoid null comparisons um, is to use instance of, which is good if you're looking for a specific type of object. Uh, you just pass in the constructor and it'll return true or false. Uh, the other one is to use type of. So if you're expecting a string, a number, or a Boolean, uh, use type of instead, it returns a string value that's either string number or boolean. Um, there's also a couple others like function and object. Uh, but generally, that's how you work around it. So anytime you're comparing something against null, take a step back and see if that's really what you mean to do. And look at it, say, am I accomplishing what I'm really trying to accomplish? See if instance of or type of works in, uh, and make your code more maintainable. And the next one is to use constants. So there's a lot of times when um, you use constants in traditional languages. And JavaScript doesn't really have the idea of constants, uh, but logically we can pretend like they do. And constants should be used in a variety of different ways. Um, this particular function has two things that really should be pulled out. Uh, one, there's a message that is going to be displayed to the user. And two, there's a URL. Now, a message being displayed to the user can change based on locale. So you should never have those buried inside of your functions. It's a really bad idea. Um, and even if you're not going to be internationalizing, it's still a bad idea to have in there because you need to go burying through application code to figure out where this string is when it pops up in the UI. 
uh, the URL, URLs change. Uh, they do a lot more frequently than we care to admit. So anytime you're using a URL, you should be pulling that out into some constant elsewhere. I mean, you can do it as simply as defining a constant's object and putting all of your constants in there. So here I've just replaced it. I have a constant's object that's holding those two values. That object can exist anywhere. It can be in a completely separate file, which somehow, which sometimes helps with internationalization. Um, you could even separate it out further. You may have one object that deals specifically with UI strings and one that deals specifically with URLs. It's completely up to you. The point is to pull that data outside of your application logic. And so these are the times when you should really be using constants. Again, anytime you have a repeated unique value, you should definitely pull that out because you don't want to have to go to two or more places to update anything. Uh, any UI strings, again, for internationalization purposes, should definitely be pulled out of the application logic. Any URLs, it's again, because they change frequently, should definitely be pulled out. And the last one is any value that may change in the future. So if you have a maximum number of items that's going to be appearing in an area, that's a pretty good candidate to pull out and put into a constant somewhere because chances are someone along the way is going to say that they want a different number there. Um, and again, completely up to you how you decide to organize them, but these are the types of data that you should be pulling out of the bodies of your functions. So the last part, I want to talk about build process. So a lot of people who came over from traditional OO languages, uh, or even older languages, are sort of used to the write, compile, run sequence of events. And then JavaScript came along. And I say, oh wow, we don't need to compile it anymore. So we make some changes over here, load it into a browser, boom, I'm running. Type F5, type F5, there's my development. Uh, that's really great when you're working on stuff as a hobby. But when you're working on it at an enterprise level, there's some things wrong with that. I mean, you don't want your code going as is out to your users. Um, because once you've succeeded in making it really maintainable, it means anybody can take a look at it. So now we're starting to see a little bit more of a build process introduced into JavaScript, uh, which is really good. And if you're not doing it, I'd strongly encourage you to take a look. Uh, it can really provide a lot of benefits for various reasons. Uh, there are plen there's lots of information around about uh, performance improvements uh, when you combine JavaScript files and do all kinds of post-processing to it. And again, my main point is for maintainability. It's really helpful. So what this frees you up to do is to separate stuff out into a bunch of different JavaScript files. And you don't need to worry that you're going to be stepping on somebody else's toes. I mean, old school Web 1.0 JavaScript programs one big JavaScript file that had everything in it. And that was checked into CVS. Well, that's great, but now you have three people working on it and you're getting conflicts left and right because everybody's working on the same file and it's so big that you're pushing stuff into everybody else's area. It makes much more sense to separate things out into different files, use a build process to combine them into something that is ready for distribution. So recommendations on this is have one object or one object definition per file. I mean, in OO languages like Java, C Sharp, it's pretty much standard way of doing things anyways. There's no reason why we can't do it in JavaScript too, especially if you're gonna be using a build process to combine all of these files at the end. It makes it much easier, <clears throat> reduces the amount of conflicts that you're gonna end up with, and it really just makes the entire process go much more smoothly. Uh, just make sure that when you do that, you indicate your dependencies. This can either be in a config file or you can put it in a comment in the script itself. Just make sure that you're telling people what has to be loaded in order for this particular bunch of code to actually work. Because as soon as you end up with a bunch of different files, uh, there's possibilities that things will be included in the wrong order or you're expecting something to be there that may not actually be there. Uh, it's really important to communicate that. And when you use a build step, that's your opportunity to do all kinds of interesting things. Um, combine the files in the appropriate order. And the fewer JavaScript files that you have going out to production, the better off you are. Uh, strip out your comments and your white space. 
you know, you're going to save some space over the wire. Uh, and you can even put in a step in that build process to validate code if you want to. We have the tools. And it, just stick it in there uh, using whatever build tool you like. If you want GMake, if you want to use Ant, whatever it is. You can put in a little validation step that can throw up an error that says, oh, you know what, I just caught this syntax error. You may not want to uh, be using this right now. You might want to go fix this first. That is your opportunity to do all kinds of fixes and validation and post-processing to make sure that your code is ready to go out, to make sure that it's production quality. So what were we just talking about? It has been a long time. I kind of forgot myself, so let's go over it. Um, when you're talking about maintainable JavaScript, really we're talking about four things. First is code conventions. Um, talk about it amongst your teammates. Figure out what works best for you. Indent your code, comment your code. Do things that makes it more readable. Loose coupling. Make sure that your JavaScript, your CSS, and your HTML are as separate as possible. Make sure that your event handlers are just handling events and then handing off their duties to other methods that are actually doing the application logic. Programming practices. Do the things that make your code make more sense. Don't compare against null. Throw your own errors. Make your debugging life easier. And finally is the build process. Use one, love one, you'll, you will grow to love it once you start. Uh, it really is, it, there's a lot of places that have build processes for JavaScript right now. Um, check it out online, go and search, read about it. Uh, it's a really interesting thing that can help you out a lot. 